Okay. Hi, Lewis. How are you? Very well. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, no. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you have a book called The Volume, which I know you're here to promote. Before we get to the book, though, I want to ask you a little bit about conceptual art, as this has uh, been your career, it looks like, for many years, yeah? Yeah, since the mid-60s, actually. The mid-60s. Okay, so quite a while. Um, I went online and I looked at some of your work, and the one I really liked was the Monopoly board. I thought that was great. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's actually a more literal one. But um, now, you want to know what conceptual art really is? Yeah, yeah give us a definition. Okay. Uh, look, until the mid 60s, uh, roughly art was based on how you make it. And so if people ask me, what do you do? And I say, I'm an artist, they always say, oh, you paint. So it's like based on the craft. And since conceptual art, art has assumed more its function as an instrument for knowledge and not for making. So it works with ideas, but not just in a literal way. It also proposes problems the same way or investigates problems the same way like a scientist would do. Except that in art, you are not bound by cause and effect or by logic or by making sense, but you are allowed to imagine freely and not make sense or fail or deal with absurdity or deal with scientific thinking. And in that sense, I personally consider that art is what we can call a meta discipline, a discipline that encompasses all other disciplines and allows you to think freely and then slowly ad adapt yourself to reality and find the compromises. So I can think of how do I bring a cloud into a bottle and realize I cannot do that. And then I have the choice of disregarding the issue or trying to recreate a cloud in a bottle and defy a normal expectation. While a scientist would try to confirm a normal expectation or to enter a path of predictability. Well, I think that makes sense. Were you around at the same time that Andy Warhol? Did you know him? Yeah. 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 I didn't meet him, no, but I was keenly aware because for me he was important because of that but he dealt with problems not with making and my background is actually printmaking originally and he did a lot of printmaking and did it in the most sloppy way possible which meant that he integrated sloppiness into the finished product <laughs> as a valid tool and I sound found that path-breaking. I, I think it's very important. Would you consider Picasso to be a conceptual artist? No. I think he is actually probably the, old, the last big craftsman, like in the line of Michelangelo and so Oh, I see. Okay. But not a conceptual artist, even with his uh, more modern no, work? Because the, the problems he proposed are really not that important. I think cubism is interesting, but it does not change our perception or our way of thinking. So I would think that the same amount of people that enjoyed the cubist paintings of Picasso, which for me are the more important ones, uh, that that consumer base is pretty much the same that it was 100 years ago. While uh, Brunelleschi's use of perspective changed or affirmed our way of seeing, and it's although it's not true, it's still the way we see. And look, when we look at things, we scan things. We don't look at one point in infinity or one stage in the theater. We look all over and compose one image. But the image we compose is still according to the laws of the Renaissance and not to the laws of Picasso. 
No, I don't want to get too in depth with it because I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll lose most of my audience. I just wanted to give people kind of an overview of what conceptual art is. And uh, is there schools for conceptual art? Uh, not specialized, but schools are veering towards using art as cognition and not art as craft. And craft is still important, but it's important for the presentation. Like when you send a letter, you want a neat letter and well written and without mistakes. So if I do a painting, I do a painting neatly or sort of and present it so that it can be read the way I want it to be read. But what matters is the content, not the content in terms of narrative, but the problem and the solution that a painting carries. And that break in the mid of the 20th century is in certain ways irreversible because when I today look at Michelangelo, I may admire how well he did his carving, but I'm looking for what am I learning from him? Am I learning something from what he is telling me or am I not? Am I understanding what he's telling me or am I not? So the level of criticism of art has shifted. It's not anymore how well something is done, but how important is it for what we may learn? And how long does this survive? I don't think Michelangelo survives very well, except that he was a great stone carver and a great painter in terms of his skills. All right, let's talk about your book because we're kind of running down on time. Your book is called The Volume and it's uh, yeah. your first children's book, according to your bio. Have yes. you written other books it's before? Other books, but more scholarly books about what we just have been I've been talking about, okay. And particularly applied to Latin America, which is my region, although I live in New York. All right. Tell us a little about the volume. The volume was, I always distrusted baby talk. You know, when <laughs> adults speak to babies, like say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And most of children books are a version of visual and narrative baby talk. And I have three grandchildren and I said, OK, let's make a book which, number one, allows me to explore together with the child rather than tell things to the child, raise questions, uh, deal with connecting knowledge from one area to another, and talk to a child as a full-blown mind, which is different to mine, but not inferior or more limited than mine. And so that's a book. The book starts with a big bang and one dot falls off onto a page and starts exploring the page. And in order to do that without boredom, multiplies and multiplies like amoebas do. And, uh, eventually reproduces and makes a line and the line eventually in the same predicament reproduces as well. It becomes a surface and covers the page and then the page multiplies and so on. So that's the story, how from the Big Bang you end up in the fact that a lost line in this process starts drawing and writing. Where did, where did it inspired this book? Where did this come from? Uh, if you want to know the truth, it happened because I had a uh, kidney stone taken out and I was sort of bound to a table near the bathroom. <laughs> and at that point, I decided, OK, how about a children's book? <laughs> that seems a perfect activity. So that's a biographical background of the book. The other one is that knowledge should be available to everybody with the same standards. And it became a challenge. How do I share the way I think as an artist with a child without compromising the thinking? 
and helping the child to think in a creative, artistic way. I think the schooling, which is actually what is my primary focus in my old age, uh, how to enrich the school situation and get it out of being limited to uh, lecture writing, reading and writing and numeracy, and keep imagination alive at full speed during the whole process of education from kindergarten to postgraduate to life in general and keep alive our way of making connections with everything and not limited just to profit and functionality. That's a very limited perspective. There's much more going on in the universe than just that. I would agree. And we lose, yeah. we lose that in school very quickly. Yeah. What age group yeah. is this book geared towards? I think it's listed from eight, eight years up. I, I don't believe in those categories. I think that parents would know when a child has enough equipment to make connections. And it's much younger than one would believe. Uh, I mean, there are studies that believe that seven years is a breaking point. But I have made conceptual, in quotations, conceptual exercises for four-year-olds, and they work fine. You can deal with gravity and have children understand when things fall, that they fall. And that's not a miracle. There's a reason, and you explore the reason with a child. And it may not understand the full implication or the full scientific background, but the concept is accessible much earlier than we believe. Well, children have a much easier time learning multiple languages than adults yeah. do. Uh, it's amazing how many languages kids can understand at a very young age, and they all run like one language in their head if they have bilingual yeah. parents. But, I, I think actually that all children should be uh, formed bilingually, at least. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And uh, I, I was raised in, in Spanish and German, both of my parents. And I discovered that that allows me to constantly be aware of what the other language, the one I'm not talking in the particular moment, is actually saying. And not take words for granted and be critical about how they're loaded, what it actually is behind the wording. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's a fascinating exercise. I, uh, and if you are imprisoned in one language, you cannot do that. And if you then acquire language much later, you don't acquire it the same way. No. And art, in that sense, is another language from which you can analyze whatever you do in your so-called native language or acquired languages. Well, Lewis, we do have to wrap this up. We are out of time. Do you have a website you want to give out? No, I, I don't like websites. I, I don't like uh, ego trips. Okay. But I'm, I mean, if you Google my name, you find places, you find my gallery, you find other books I wrote. So it's not that I want to be anonymous, but I don't like to flaunt it. Okay, well, the book is available on Amazon and other booksellers, yeah? Yeah, it is. Okay. Barnes & Noble, probably, and so on. All right, great. Well, thanks for coming on the show and sharing. It was very interesting.